Well, good afternoon. I don't have anything, I don't have any fancy technology. I hardly know how to use my smartphone. And Tom, I would love to stop contributing to the municipal uh, coffers of DC. And the way to sell electric cars is to have them exempt from those speed cameras that we all pay for. Good afternoon, and, and, and I'm very happy to be here, and I'd like to thank Lisa and her, her staff for putting together this great event. Also like to <clears throat> thank Tom Farrell for the foundation board support and vision uh, that has us here, and about the thing that I'm going to talk to you about. This is powering the people. We've heard about electric transportation, the second digital decade, and we will hear about the role of technology. I hope you've had an opportunity to go through the exhibits. Uh, they're really exciting. And one of the things that I would tell you that it should remind us that it hasn't been since the turn of the 19th century that I believe that electricity could be a transformative force in society. It will change the way we work. It will change the way we learn. It will change the way we travel, the structure of our industries, the planning of our towns. It'll be an, un, an unparall unparalleled builder of increased human efficiency, and it'll even change the structure of our families. Now, this may all sound terribly fanciful, but this is the history. This is what's already happened, and it will happen again. You may see bits and pieces out there, but it all represents great possibility. And if this last talk didn't tell you about this great possibility, about informating everything, informating the networks. We talk about smart meters, but it's all about putting information into our use and consumption of electricity, which will build efficiency, which will make everything we do better. It's a bright future for those who have been up here. It's not just the lights. And it would be great if these were LED lights. All right, there's much about lighting we don't even understand but another great technology which will change things significant, including the negative health impacts of artificial light. It was disrupted when the first incandescent bulbs came out, and it's never been fixed. But people are now treating Alzheimer patients with light in the blues to help them sleep better. They're starting to use light in the blues to help autistic children improve. There are many things we still don't understand, but the information and the technology is there and it will change us again. And it's the tradition and history of this industry and the people in this room that makes it happen. So it is this great, exciting, bright future. And you know what? You have to be exciting here because we don't stand a chance of repowering the world, energizing anybody if we don't start here. It all starts here. So you can feel free to get excited, okay? <laughs> But Tom said something else this morning which is very important. It's not necessarily bright for everyone. 1.3 billion people on Earth have no access at all to electricity. One billion have access, and I've seen this, but it's not to reliable energy. In India, they count a village as being electrified if it has one pole and one light. Really, it doesn't have anything to do with access. It happens to do with government statistics. So you have another billion who don't have access to reliable energy, and you have another three billion who, don't, who rely on biomass and solid fuels for cooking and heating. So this is a tremendous part of this world that doesn't have these benefits. They don't share your excitement. Their excitement is getting to the end of the day. And this is an opportunity for us as, as well, because we know that access to electricity improves light. We know that to, to electricity improves lives. What does it do? It, it helps children study after dark. It improves health by eliminating the, the, the smoke and the emissions from the, all those biofuels and the kerosene for lamps. It provides uh, domestic water and water for agriculture. It prevents disease by giving refrigeration to food and medicine. And it's probably the single force to liberating women in emerging markets. Women do the domestic labor, and it's the domestic labor that can be replaced with electrification. They can be liberated from that work, they can become part of the economy, they can earn money, they can support their families. It's the single greatest source of liberation for women in the emerging markets. And lastly, security. 
you know, just stepping aside, a lot of people like to quote um, <coughs> Supreme Court Justice uh, Brandeis when they talk about misdeeds in government. And they always say, sunlight is said to be the best of disinfectants. That's only the first half of his sentence. Does anybody know what the sentence, second half of that sentence is? It's not a quiz, I'll tell you anyway. The second part of that sentence is, and electric light is the most efficient policeman. Okay? And it still is. Lighting of public spaces, whether they're in the favelas of Brazil or in villages in sub-Saharan Africa with as something as simple as a solar-powered lantern provides security and safety. Things that you take for granted. But you know what? Even in our society, what's one of the biggest research areas for security and lighting? Parking lots. It's the same. It's a sense of security. And it's provided by electricity. And it's provided by light. Indeed, U.S. Secretary General Ban Ki-moon defines access to reliable and ele affordable electricity as the golden thread that connects development, social inclusion, and environmental protection. The golden thread. And today I'm pleased to announce the start, the launch of the Edison Foundation's Universal Access Initiative. Its objective is to expand electricity to reach individuals and communities that are part of those billions who still don't have access. It wants to provide electricity in ways that are socially, financially, environmentally sustainable, and replicable. So we're talking about business models. We're not just talking about technology. An initial group of electric utilities, technology companies, and other partners gathered in January here in Washington to explore the boundaries, to try to figure out if this was a good idea. Among those who gathered were the Brookings Institute, American Electric Power, Duke, National Grid, Broadscale Group, Silver Spring Networks, Alstom, and the Copper Development Association, the University of Michigan, ERB Institute for Sustainable Enterprise, and AES. And in June, at the EEI meeting, we will announce the first universal access projects. Now, what might these include? Well, they might include solar-powered schools and medical facilities, but not just the solar powering, but the sustainable models that could be replicable. It might include the creation and design of nested or microgrids, grid infrastructure for poor urban areas. Mass urbanization is a trend in the world, and the majority of that mass urbanization is poor and takes place in informal communities. These are what you hear about when you hear about barrios, shanty towns, favelas. We'll look at opportunities to use smart metering technology in those areas to better understand how electricity is used to improve safety. Now, all of that will go along with programs to educate the people about electricity and efficiency, to value the proper use and development as they move to electrification. Well, let me give you some personal experience that might shed some light on this. It's, you know, AES operates in 25 countries, only one of those being the United States. We're on five continents, and we produce enough electricity to serve a population of over 100 million people. We do that in developing countries, but we do that also in emerging markets and frontier markets. Now, if you've not been to a frontier market, that's the beginning of the continuum. These are places like sub-Saharan Africa. We were fortunate enough to participate in the Millennium Challenge Corporation's initiative for poverty elimination through rural electrification in the northern regions of El Salvador. It was a project that began in 2009 and ended in 2012. It benefited 94 municipalities and gave access to over 36,000 families. Now, in the emerging world, you can multiply that between four and six times if you want population. It provided over 2,500 direct and indirect jobs, and it increased electrification in the area to 90 percent. Now, those statistics are really powerful. But let me tell you the most powerful part for me. We had one of our electric crews actually putting up this uh, uh, network. And at the end of the day, when one of our line mechanics was putting his things away, a member of the local village where they had just finished work approached him. Now, I've been in this industry for a long time, <laughs> okay, for a long time. And we all know that when a lineman is out and someone from the community approaches him, you don't know what they're going to say, okay? Sometimes it's good. And a lot of it was good during the storm restoration for Sandy, but sometimes it's not so good. And when they have a machete in their hands, which is what normally these people will be carrying, you never know. 
But what this fellow said to our line mechanic was so impressive that he went back to the office and he wrote me an email. And he said, this is what the fellow told him, you have no idea of the change you are making in our lives. Since I was a little kid, I remember hearing my father say that someday power lines will come to our house. And after many, many years, that day has finally come and now I can see that dream has come true. Now my children will have the opportunity to study by night or read or write, something that was impossible for me. The fellow who wrote this note to me, his name was Jorge Herrera, and he said the following. He said he never knew that his work, the work that he did, could contribute to making people's dreams come true. Making dreams come true. That's what universal access is all about. However, participation in the universal access initiative is more, more than altruism, more than corporate charity. There is underlying this a very real, sound, and palpable value proposition. And among its elements are these. Developing a corporate sustainability currency. Every investor-owned utility will be measured by potential investors on its sustainability practices, its sustainable corporate social responsibility practices. This provides that currency. It will enhance brand equity. It will attract and retain talent. Can you imagine? You don't have to be in El Salvador, but if you're part of a company in Indianapolis, in, o in Dayton, out in, the, in, uh, in uh, uh, Portland, and you know that you're helping make people's dreams come true, that's a very powerful way to attract and retain young professionals. Developing partnerships that can be brought to bear in domestic markets. If you're involved in a program like this and you have technology partners, what you will do together you could bring back into your own markets here in the U excuse me, to the U.S. You can bring technologies to scale faster. This is for the technology partners in the audience. You will also be able to demonstrate the new technologies and solve problems that you have not yet seen in the United States, especially if you're working in these informal communities with the urban poor. You'll have growing opportunities for investment and you will be gaining credit for reduced emissions and carbon footprint because the places that do not have electricity are terribly, terribly polluting because they're using fossil-based fuels as the alternative. So today, we kick off the foundation's drive to enroll companies in this initiative. Now, let me tell you what that means. It means we want your ideas. We want your intellectual support. We want your spiritual support, which is important. But also important is we need your financial support. Now, that's a nice way of saying we need your money because this stuff costs money. But there's great value here, and it's great value that we all want to share. And before I finish, let me just read one more quote. One more quote, which is a, a plea for this type of activity. I say, give us the opportunity of attaining the highest civilization we can enjoy. Give us sound and healthy bodies. Give us no more darkness, but give us electric light. It is the poor as well as the rich man's light it will light our suburbs as well as our, the central portions of our cities. In fact, it is light for all. Now, you might think that's a plaintive cry from Cameroon or Sub-Saharan Africa or villages in India or perhaps favelas in Brazil. But this was a report in the Electric World magazine from August 22nd, August 22nd, 1885, at the National Electric Light Association's second annual conference here in the United States. We can do this. We have done it. It's our history. It's our tradition. So please join us in this most important initiative. Thank you. Thank you.